Wait, hang so. on. We're going to get into all this. Okay. Yeah. You're a all true right. New Yorker. Born and raised? I am. There we go. Okay. Respect. All right. Uh, how are we, how we looking on time? Uh, almost there. Just another minute. Okay. Are you still, are you a, a Long Islander, Manhattanite? I was born in Kew Gardens. Ah, who was on your show today? Who was on my show today? We just talked. Oh, we had Ray, we had Ray Romano on uh, CNBC okay. with us. A neighbor. And uh, he he's from Forest Hills. Okay. So I asked him a trick question. I said, uh, which you have one dinner you can plan in Queens. Uh, you have a bunch of people in from out of town. They want the best Italian food. Do you take them to Parkside? Or do you take them to Michael shaking uh, his head? Or do you take them to Don Pep Don Peppy's? Neither. Okay. I, I I wouldn't have even been able to close to answer the question at all. He couldn't answer it. He okay. said, "I'll go to one for dinner, one for dessert." <laughs> so he he squirmed it. Ray squirmed out of it. Um, do you you don't you don't know this? Uh, Everybody loves Raymond. Took place in Lynbrook, which is two it towns did? over from us. I was yes. in Lynbrook last night. That's where I saw the movie. Pause. The, the, when they did the exterior shot of the house, the house they used was 135 Margaret Boulevard in Merrick. Really? Do you know what house I grew up in? 124 Margaret Boulevard. They literally took an exterior from a house five houses <clears throat> down from mine. As the So when, whenever you watch Everybody Loves Raymond, that's the house that they're showing. Hmm. I used to walk past that house Where's Margaret? every day. Uh, Merrick Woods. Okay. Near uh, Merrick Avenue. All right, we're ready to go? All right, let's do it. Coming in with oh, wow. All right, let's see. Bombs away. The Couple and Friends, episode 101. Today's show is brought to you by Horizon Kinetics and their medical ETF. The ticker for that is MedX, that's M-E-D-X, which invests primarily in pharmaceuticals and biologics. On today's show, we spoke a lot about how AI is going to impact all areas of the economy. Certainly, drug manufacturing is one of them. If you're looking for a way to participate in the market, this might be of interest to you. To learn more about how you could invest in this fund, please visit horizonkinetics.com. Oh, my God. We've done this 101 times. It's hard to believe. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Compound and Friends. I'm your host, Downtown Josh Brown, here with my co-host, Michael Batnick, as always. John is here. Duncan is here. Nicole is here. George is here. Hey, George. <laughs> thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have a very special guest uh, on the show today, someone that is highly influential for Michael and I, and I believe one of the most well-regarded research people in the industry, every financial advisor uh, who is in the know is getting his stuff on a regular basis. His name is Michael Sembolist. Michael, say hello to the crowd. Hello, crowd. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michael is the chairman of Market and Investment Strategy for JP Morgan Asset Management and the author of Eye on the Market since 2005. Michael is also a member of the JP Morgan Asset Management Investment Committee. Michael has spent 36 years at J.P. Morgan, having joined the firm in 1987. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks. We're so happy to have you. That's a long time to have been at one bank. That's actually very rare. There's a few people left. Okay, so so so, uh, what is it about J.P. Morgan uh, that that has kept you uh, in in that building? I know it's a new building right now. Oh, but it's what, a different building. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it, what is it about that particular firm? Um, and, and, and why have you been there for this long, and, and what do you love about it? Well, you know, there's um, – you accrue so many relationships yeah. uh, and over the course of time. I have three analysts on my team. That's it. And really? That's yeah, it? That's okay. it. And, but I don't need more than that because if I need to talk to somebody in the investment bank or the commercial bank, I mean, I've accrued a lot of goodwill with those guys. I've done a lot of stuff for them over the years. I would, I would lose all, I don't want my boss to hear this, but I would lose all of that, of those accrued relationships and networks if I went to some other firm. Okay. And I've also, you know, I've done a lot of work for the board. I do a lot of stuff for Jamie directly and, and uh, I get a lot out of that and I learn a lot from doing that. So I like it there. Okay, very cool. Well, we read your stuff all the time. And uh, before we dive deeply into some of your more recent charts and insights, I do want to get into uh, I do want to get into inflation because the CPI report this week 
it's just one of those moments, at least this is my, my take, I don't want to hear yours. It's one of those moments where the stock market had been defying the economic data pretty much since January 1st, almost in a straight line for the NASDAQ. And this week seemed like a watershed moment where a lot of people who had been either fighting it or waiting it out or uh, only sort of getting comfortable with more equity exposure or sort of getting comfortable with the possibility of soft landing, this report seemed to me a moment where a lot of those people said, I'm wrong. Uh, let me do something about it. And they probably bought uh, futures uh, on the queues or something. But uh, I'd love to hear your take on this week's CPI report and the reaction to it, more importantly. I mean, the amazing thing about it was that a basic set of leading indicators of producer prices and consumer prices has been screaming this result for months. And you guys read my stuff. Yes. I mean, the, the stalest statistic in the entire universe of statistics is owner's equivalent rent, which yeah. is a huge part of CPI, right? So the way that the, the BLS and the, you know, the government computes housing inflation is entirely backward looking. And for the last year and a half, we've been looking at Redfin and Zillow and other kind of more high frequency indicators about what's going on in the real estate market. And so, it, it, I mean, this was kind of, pre we didn't know exactly which month it was going to kick in, right. but we saw this building for months. The, the supply chain delays were telling us what was going to happen to goods prices months ago. Um, you know, we still have a tight labor market. And if there's any big surprise, it's how quickly we're seeing normalization of CPI when you still have a pretty tight labor market and high wage inflation. But John, can you throw up this chart of wage, wage growth, please, uh, as Michael's, Michael's discussing? But Josh, you mentioned that the stock market was defying economic data. I'd say it was defying sentiment more than, because the data has been fine. But to, to Michael's point about the strong labor market, the growth in wages are trending in the right direction, yep. meaning down. Yeah, the first derivative on this is moving the right way. And uh, a lot of people got too caught up in the jolts data. Yeah, and one of the, one of the interesting things about the jolts data is the quality of it uh, is is deteriorating, and y people don't look at that. Before COVID, they used to get a seventy percent response rate. Now it's like thirty. And who and who is responding? But wasn't jolts data? Wait, you were uh, jolts data was not bullshit entirely. But I think you, were you writing a lot about the warehousing of this that people were just the companies who were just leaving the jobs up, the job openings up and not filling them. There's a lot of staleness in the data and there's a lot of staleness in the responses. It's not like the PMI survey, which they're more rigorous about. And uh, so I don't know. It's, but the, 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 the pig in the Python issue for goods inflation and for housing inflation has been evident for some time. I'm going to hit you with another aspect of this that I don't know if it's material or not, but I'd love to hear what you think. If you were collecting jobs data in 19... 83 or 1993 and not 2023, you could reliably look at posted jobs and count them as one for one for one. Uh, in, in the modern era, and my firm is an example of this, we have 63 employees. Most of them are not in New York. We have a lot of variability in where we'll hire people. We just want the best person. That person could be in Ohio, they could be in Florida, they could be in California, uh, preferably not California for tax reasons. But my point is, we could post a job. It's one job. We could post it in seven different states. Yeah, I'm only going to fill it once. I'm gonna, I'm gonna interview people in all seven places. Is that seven jobs based on the way they're um, capturing this data, or is it one they, job? They would say it starts as seven jobs, and then they run algorithms to distill it down to the true one job. Do you think it is. they are able to do that? And and I think that's hard. I think that's hard. I think too. it's hard to do Al on a high frequency basis. Algorithms don't know what's in my heart. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. And I wanted to get into that because I think that's an aspect of this is the nature of being hired has changed. And it's more remote now. And it makes it's got to make it harder to count, you know, available job openings, for example. Right. And it's it's also flattering real estate vacancy statistics, which look bad, but are worse once you look at the underutilization of that space. So that's the flip side of the same coin. Michael, okay. you mentioned uh, the way that the government calculates inflation and uh, with shelter specifically, I'm sorry. Yes. And that's, is that a third of the basket? Around. Uh, could you explain to the audience, what is the difference between what they're calculating versus what is actually happening? Well, they're, they're computing something called owner's equivalent rent. 
And so they're trying to figure out the for somebody that owns a home, how much would they rent it for? Um, so it's it's a it's, it's a, a very it's a nonsense stat, right? It's not. They would say that there's too much variability and uncertainty in in Schiller home price indices to use those as an index because you'd have to use something called like a same store price thing. You'd have to look at the same home, the same home over, and there's over such time. a long period of time over which the same home will sell that they won't have high frequency contemporaneous day on housing inflation. So okay. they came up with this, uh, you know, they came up with the, they were, this ha- owner's equivalent rent. And, you know, typically with, with inflation statistics, they'll come up with an approach. It'll work for a while. Then it'll stop working. They'll defend it for 15 to 20 years, and, and then they make a change. <laughs> I remember um, when, you have, when you have bad information to release as a company, you do it in the week between Christmas and New Year's. Yes. Right? When, you, when, you're a, when you're a government agency and you want to announce that your old methodology wasn't so good, but you're going to change it, you do it in the last two weeks in August. Okay. And – uh, for years, a lot of people were saying that the productivity numbers for the technology sector were underestimated because they weren't capturing, you know, the cloud and various software enhancements. And, you know, they, they fought, the government fought it for a while and then basically conceded a few years ago that technology deflation was twice the level that they had been recording it wow. at, which therefore was underestimating both real GDP growth and, and productivity. And so, look, these things happen. They change over time. The nature of the economy changes. And I don't think we should be surprised that inflation computing agencies tend to respond to that kind of thing with a lag. Assuming that inflation stays at its current pace and or drops over the second half of the year, my best guess is that CPI, PPI, PCE will be less Super Bowl-esque in terms of like when they're released. The market's now going to move on to something new. Like there's always the stat of the moment. Unless we get surprises in the other direction. Right. So assuming we don't, Maybe, maybe maybe it's a little bit lumpy and you get a little bit of an uptick than a downtick. Where do you think the puck is going next? What is M- the investment margins. market? Margins. Mm, Corporate right. profit margins. Yes. Because More so than delinquencies or right. credit card That's reserves. Right. Yeah. Or, okay. I mean, we, you're seeing some weakness in subprime auto and the usual suspects and, you know, the lower tier credit card companies and things like that. Um, but back high, to 2019 levels. No. High, high yield default rates have picked up a little. Bankruptcies have picked up Should a little. Should the margins improve but, if, if inflation is coming down? Yeah, but if, if inflation goes down, top line revenue goes down. But if uh, the labor markets stay tight, I mean, the, you know, more than interest rates, more than commodity prices, labor is 70% of, of cost inputs in the U.S. corporate sector. I didn't get into Pepsi's report today, but I saw somebody tweet something about their uh, prices are up 30% over the last couple of years. And their volume has not really budged at all. Yeah, I mean, the the in the last quarter, I think revenues were up four percent, roughly, you know, below the rate of inflation. So in real terms, revenue growth has been a little weak. So I think the next thing we have to watch for is the next two quarters of what happens to market. So how do you you watch that during earnings season, company by company, or is there a catch all uh, data point that people could follow that? Is well, I, I, I like I like to look at the difference in the ISM survey. Okay, my if you had a you know, I spend time looking at lots of numbers. I'm a numbers guy. You read this stuff. Yeah. If I only had one thing I could look at, it would be the new orders minus inventories in the ISM. If I had to pick one thing and you wouldn't tell me anything else and you made me invest. Okay, why? Based What's on, in there? Well, you're basically looking at the on a leading indicator basis the difference between new orders and and inventories, right? And, and what so, is that what is that but what does that tell you? As an, oh. as an investor or somebody trying to understand what's happening oh, in the that's, economy. Oh, that's a driver of the business cycle right there because the Goldilocks situation is when you're seeing order in, you know orders picking up and inventories are low, right? That's a recipe for non-inflationary growth and margin expansion. Yeah. Over the last few months, we've had the opposite, which is that new orders were falling and we had an inventory surplus. Is it is it too early for you to say that they've they did it they achieved a soft landing. The, oh, is the, it too early? The immaculate disinflation. Um, and what would you need to say? If, meaning, if it is? meaning, meaning, di- disinflation without job without loss. a recession, without yeah. a recession, without yeah. a recession, and without okay. meaningful job loss. I mean, right, right. employment rates ticked yeah. up a little bit. Uh, yeah, what one quarter doesn't get you there, but boy, you know, people in the CPI report, 
people do look at things like sticky CPI, median CPI. They rip they rip the CPI data to <laughs> I like, shreds. I prefer core X shelter. Right. <laughs> they, I mean, you, they slice it to pieces. And all of those sliced pieces, there's a Cleveland median. Like, why would you ever bother, right? But there's a Cleveland median CPI. All of these little slices improved markedly with the report yesterday. I want to see at least one more before I get carried away. All right, so it, one more, one more quarter. Of yeah, I want to see another month. Or another month. month. Okay, I want to see another month. I, I want to make sure that the disinflation in the goods sector, auto prices, auto parts, healthcare well, services. Here's what's interesting, though, you don't ha you have another Fed meeting this month before we get the next CPI, right? And then August, there is no Fed meeting. They're right. all in Wyoming doing whatever they do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so you don't have another meeting till September. Is it is it is it possible? that they think they're doing more rate hikes, but- Well, the market does. Why? Well, I, I I think the more telling thing is that the markets are pricing in 150 basis points of easing over the next 12 to 18 months. That's where I think the markets may be offside. Do you think those, so you don't, do you, are, are, the, are those markets wrong? So I'm looking at like the CME FedWatch tool, for example. Right. Um, and that shifts all the time. So right now there's a 92% probability of them going another 25 basis points during the next meeting. Right. But I was saying to Josh on this uh, this week, if Powell is explaining to people who are listening to the press conference that the full effects of their interest rate hikes have yet to be felt, takes a while for it to filter through the economy, yeah. why would he say that and then continue to go? One pause I don't and then know. go? I, th I think the Fed generally in most cycles, when rates, when, when inflation surprises on the upside, the Fed has two basic choices. Do you follow it all the way up and then follow it down? Or do you follow it up and then stop, but the trade-off is afterwards you don't ease as much? I think the Fed is, is going to take the, the latter path, which is they're not going to tighten as much as some any kind of Taylor rule or traditional Volcker approach would have dictated, which would argue for another hike or two. And I think the trade-off is they don't ease as much as what the markets are pricing in. So, but so remember, there's been a lot of tightening. The San Francisco Fed computes uh, the, this estimate of true Fed tightening, which is the basis points of tightening plus the impact on the, of the declining balance sheet. We've had something closer to 700 basis points of tightening than 500. If you and they that. and they have now Fed funds rate above uh, year over year inflation. So if you believe if you believe core inflation is five point one or whatever right. they say it is, uh, you're pretty much at parity now with right. where overnight money is. Yeah. So the need to go forward, I guess the need to go forward is they're not seeing the difference between a pandemic induced supply chain driven inflation versus a 1970s style recurring inflation where if we give up too early, it's going to bounce right back. That must be what they're worried about. I think so. You also have to remember something, which is Labor Day 2021, the Fed was projecting one Fed hike yeah, over the next that. 12 months. Yeah, they don't know. Okay, hang on. So then what happened? Everything blows up in their face. Ironically, somebody gets a Nobel Prize for all of this during that time, <laughs> and which is amazing. But anyway, <laughs> then all of a sudden it blows, the whole experiment blows up on them. And Bill Dudley, of all people, writes a, a, a journal op-ed saying, you know what, we, we better re-examine what we did because we, we got it wrong. Yeah. And I think that that experience weighs heavily on the Fed here, which, you know, the last thing you ever want to, 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 to die and have your epitaph be, you know, this guy was another Arthur Burns, right? That's right. the nightmare of everybody that works at the Fed. Nobody wants that. Which is being accused of, of kind of stoking another great inflation the way Arthur Burns did working when, when Nixon basically forced him. There's a great book that talks about some of the things that Nixon um, uh, did to Arthur Burns to, to convince him to ease during- He, sho he shoved him against the wall or no, is that something that's else? LBJ. No, no, no. Nick, Nick, Nixon basically did a bunch of dirty tricks. They they threatened to expand the number of governors on the Fed board, and the, and uh, William Saffer writer wrote a book. And he it, at one point Nixon told his aides, "We have Arthur Burns by the balls on the money supply." That's fun. Which was amazing to me because I didn't know that Nixon knew what money supply actually was. Right. Um, and by the way, he remember he did all of this to manipulate an election. He won 49 states to one. Right. But yeah, so I think the Fed, Dudley's article kind of really pushed the Fed into being a little bit defensive about how it got to where it got to. So on the margin, 
the, the, the Fed the doesn't I- want to make them t- under tighten here. I was going to say the irony of the stock market reaction this week, st- uh, I don't know how many trillion dollars we just added in market cap over the last three months, but it's mostly predicated on we're winning the battle against inflation. The Fed's almost done. Could that wealth effect actually serve to keep inflation high if this market keeps going uh, higher? I think the wealth the, effect the, is bullshit. The, 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 you know, the propensity to spend in the upper incomes goes where up those, with the market. Yes, but no, it doesn't. The propensity yes, to spend of the wealthy is much lower than at lower income brackets. So if you tell me that there's a lot of wealth creation, I don't think that that necessarily translates into consumption. They'll, they'll just keep it in TV. They'll just keep it in TV. They Bezos, don't have to spend it. Bezos is getting another yacht because his stock went up. No, but why do you have to use the richest person in the world? <laughs> to make example? my point. <laughs> is there anyone in between you and Bezos that well, we could I, consider I, I, might spend I, more money? I agree with his general point, um, which you. is that the you know the wealthier cohorts have a, a yeah they don't have to spend it. They don't feel like it's on fire right. if they've made. It. I understand. Speaking that. of the Fed, did you see? I mean, it is kind of interesting that they were trying to break the economy and they couldn't. Just I don't know what that says about <laughs> our propensity to spend money when we have it. James Bullard just resigned. Did you see that? No, I hadn't. And he was he was among the most hawkish members. Yeah. So interest rates took a no, no staff today. What's the uh, – is PPI as important as CPI? I think for, for margins it is. John, chart on, please. Okay. Uh, let's throw this up. So This is, this is like uh, in a straight line. So producer prices have increased at a slower rate for 12 consecutive months. Yeah. Which is a great thing. Yeah. And, and by the way, this was – this stuff was visible before the CPI. So, you know, if you if you were to look at this in CPI at the same time, the PPI was sending you some of those disinflation signals. Early. Where are you seeing it in, like, manufacturing data? It, yeah. Okay. You know, and specifically if you look by industry, computers, furniture, right. you know, medical hey. devices, you were seeing this in a number of different places. We're going to get to your stuff in a second. Just last yes. question for me on this topic because okay. I, I really want to know your take. A lot of people on Wall Street were screaming, what is the Fed doing waiting Inflation had been above five percent for seven months or whatever, right. and you just said that producer prices are a leading indicator. What do you? Why do you think they waited as long as they? Oh did? well, they they were they convinced just wait. they this, kept stimulating. Right? No, no, no. This 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 part is really interesting, which is they were convinced that the labor market effects of COVID were temporary, and they were waiting as inflation was going up. They they believed, and I think they rightly so that it was a wage-driven, a wage-price inflation spiral, the first one we see since the 70s. And because remember, what happened during COVID was you had this collapse in the available labor supply, a collapse in immigration, and a doubling of the retirement rate, right? So the rate of retirement, the rate of retiring people over age 55 or 64, depending on when you look at, doubled. They were convinced that as, as COVID restrictions were lifted, You'd get a normalization in the labor force participation rate and a normalization in immigration. Neither of those happened. They were waiting for it, and they kept talking about, gee, where, where are all the workers coming? You know, and, but the, the, we lost about uh, 1.5 million. So let's start here. Private sector workforce is about 130 million people. Okay, So when I talk about a million here, a million there, on the margin, those are big numbers. So... We lost about a million people, million and a half people, undocumented workers based on the immigration shutdown and the politics around it, right? And if you, you know, the the Biden administration ran on reversing Trump era immigration policy and hasn't really been able to do it until recent, until very recently. So you're missing those undocumented workers. Uh, And then on top of that, the labor force participation rate is now completely back to normal, age 55 and under. Age 55 and over. Prime, prime it, age workers. Right. But age 55 and over, it has collapsed, right? It is, it is, it's almost close to the COVID lows. Hmm. Because of that, you've had a, a reasonably important chunk of the labor market taken away on, on the older end and on the immigration. You also had a million people die. Yeah, that, 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 took, that happened too. And then you had, you, you, you had women that had for, mi- for long periods of time couldn't get proper child care. So how are they supposed to return, quote, return to, to the, the labor workforce? Force. So, right. so that's one of the reasons. The, but the Fed was expecting a rapid labor force normalization that didn't happen. That's why they waited. No, it's fine. That was, that was great. Thank you. No, it's finally normalizing. Remember the the wage gains of people that were switching jobs versus yes. people that were staying in that jobs? That was an amazing premium that you got. And that's come back. That's I, that's mostly normalized. It's come back down. Yeah. Right. I, you, saw, I saw that uh, 
I saw that uh, labor force participation rate for prime age workers is closing in on the year 2000 yes, high. Yes, it's very high. So it's 83.5% and the old high was 84 and change. That's right. So we're, so we're back in participation we terms are so for, back. for that cohort. 18 to fi- right. 50 or 49 or whatever right. it is. Right. Okay. You don't think that there's going to be any change above 50? You think, a lot of well, people I, just said, I don't work anymore. It's, it's it. you know— when you had you had soaring home values and four hundred one k values, why do they? Need and to work? you had, a, a, a and you had a disease that empirically affected older people more. I mean, you know, three strikes and you're out. There were <laughs> few reasons for people that had retired to come right. back to the labor force. Three reasons not to work. Right. I'm more in danger of getting very sick. Right. Uh, my my retirement fund is as high as it's ever been. My home value is right. s- and, shooting up. Exactly. Okay, so it makes a lot of sense in that context. Let's do oh. some of your stuff from Eye on the Market. Can you tell can you tell the listeners who aren't familiar with what you put out and 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 why? What is Eye on the Market like in your own words, and what do you try to do with with this research product? Okay, I started writing it in two thousand five. Um, before that, I wrote something else, and. You know, my day job is, is I'm, I'm the chairman of market investment strategy. Basically, I'm the chief investment officer for our asset management business, which is- How many trillions of dollars are in uh, J.P. Morgan asset management? There's assets under supervision, somewhere between three and four trillion. It's huge. It's one it's of the big. biggest, this is one of the biggest pots there, there is That's in, right. in the world. That's right. Okay. Now, you know, no, pr- bunch no, pr- of, no pressure. <laughs> well, I, look, a, a bunch of all of the numbers for the big firms are money market funds and cash equivalents. So let's not get carried away about what that number really means. Okay. okay fair. But um, uh, so our institutional business is essentially state and corporate pension plans, endowments, foundations, insurance companies, and sovereign wealth funds, um, and annuitization funds in places like Canada and Australia. And then we have a private bank, which is all the way from, you know, upper, upper, upper high net worth all the way down to people that kind of come into the branch and invest in the branch. Sure. And so um, so I, my job spans all of those different kinds of, of investors. And the eye in the market is meant to share with them our thoughts uh, that influence how we're investing money when they give us discretion to do so on, on their behalf, which is a big chunk of what we do. And um, – so I write about what, what's going on. I, I wrote recently about the barbell strategy, which had worked so well for 20 years to overweight the United States and emerging markets and underweight Europe and Japan. It was probably one of the most successful investment strategies I've ever implemented. Yeah. Um, so I write about stuff like that. And then I also write about, you know, it, it, once, once more than 10 or 15 clients ask about something, it's probably time to I was going to say, out. where do you, like, as, so Michael and I are, are uh, bloggers, and it's always like, where do you get, well, how do you know what to write? You know, <laughs> we have, you know, 20 or 30 financial advisors working here and they get questions from clients and that right. helps Yeah, because those are things that we have to do research on in order to answer. That's right. And so I was going to ask you, you must be having like high level conversations all over the bank, clients of the bank. That's probably a great font of oh, it ideas. Is. It is. To, and to I mine. also work with, um, you know, more these days, I do a lot of work with the CEOs of the investment bank and the commercial bank. So okay. I interface with a lot of them. And that's that's why I do so much work on energy. Okay. So it's both for our investment clients, but also our CEO clients. You know, there's a lot of work on the energy transition and energy-related stuff. And, you know, we can talk about that too. But. So so this month you wrote about the Magnificent Seven. Who didn't? Uh, I mean, it's, it's momentous. You've got seven stocks that are effectively 50-some-odd percent of the NASDAQ, maybe 40% of the S&P, some, something in that – it's it has happened historically a couple of times, but it's rare. The, the industrial companies at the end of the AT and T and and and, and uh, I don't know maybe GM or GE yeah. one of the G's. Uh, there, there have been moments, but this is a big deal right it is. now. Can I you. quote the gentleman sitting uh, across the table from you us? May. Go ahead. So Michael wrote. So we're talking about Nvidia, Meta, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Tesla. And Michael says, "Quote for Nvidia and Meta, sharply increased earnings expectations also explain their rise this year." For the other five stocks, earnings expectations are either flat or, in the case of Tesla, down substantially. Uh, this is this is super interesting. And yet, and and yet, Tesla up one hundred and ten percent year to date. That's six months. Apple up forty one. Microsoft up forty. Google up forty. Amazon up fifty one. Meta up one twenty five. 
NVIDIA up 181. And that's of, as of mid-June. They're all higher. Right. And okay. at the time, the rest of the market was flat. And at the top, right. Okay. So what is so what is driving that level of multiple expansion? I have theories, but you're, you're smarter than me. <sighs> I mean, it's – they are the ultimate momentum trades okay. for quant funds, hedge funds, uh, long-only growth equity funds. Okay. Uh, tremendous amounts of liquidity. Yeah. E- easy to easy to borrow against. In the, in the shares, you can get in and out. That's with, right. With a, a large hedge fund, can you buy can, and sell. That's quickly. right. You okay. can you can leverage them easily and quickly if you want to take leverage bets on them, and the the kind of storm clouds of antitrust review that started forming during the second Trump. This, I'm sorry, the second Obama administration. Have no, didn't materialize. Yeah. There have been these kind of moments. Well, she's losing ju- in court uh, now. From a judiciary, uh, in the judiciary, in the Justice Department, of, of different kinds of efforts to rein these companies in. And, yeah. and they, they haven't gotten out of the committee phase in Congress. Okay. Um, there's, they have, you know, at, at what, and I think the reason why is Right at the cusp of when they were really going to start to crack down on the ability of these companies to acquire other companies. And, you know, there are stories about how Amazon has done some very non-competitive things of the companies they've acquired to crush them and things like that. Then all of a sudden the China thing happened. Mm. And let's not miss this important point. For most of our lives, and I'm older than you, the United States has not had an industrial policy. We criticized other countries for having favored national champions and industrial policy. Then what happened? First, the Europeans started to pick on our tech firms. And they started doing this thing called digital service taxes. um, uh, And GDPR. Which basically, you know, the Europeans don't have their – they don't have European equivalents of Amazon and Google and things like that. So they started making up extra taxes they were going to impose on these companies overseas. And then you had the China thing come along. And all of a sudden – the focus has shifted away from antitrust domestically to securing domestic supply chains and um, semiconductor independence and energy independence. And so all that antitrust stuff went out the window, and that, and which is allowing these companies you mentioned to increase their market share almost on an unimpeded basis. So the politically, the appetite to, to bust Mark Zuckerberg's chops is diminished um, if we're going to be in a world now – a, a bipolar world where there's Chinese tech companies and there's Western tech companies, and they're now going to compete in a much more existential way than maybe oh, even 10 I mean, years ago. It, you know, Trump, Trump's anti-China policy was a five and Biden took it to a nine, Yeah, right? I mean, if, if you read the innards of what they've done to put the squeeze on China as it relates to not just semiconductors themselves, but software and equipment and marketing and operations, um, they they are they are really trying to cut off China from any kind of advanced chip technology that might be used in anything related to global positioning, artificial intelligence, self driving vehicles, rocketry, everything. But that has not hurt U.S. tech companies, and in fact, the stocks have gone up a lot uh, because I guess they're not under that same microscope that they were under anymore. Nope. And okay. the rest of the world is their oyster, right? They without a lot of competition. Well, you can make a good case for two of these stocks to get re rating. One is Nvidia who took their guidance from, I don't know, $7 billion to $11 billion, right. like overnight. Okay, that clearly deserved to be re-rated. And then Facebook, which is trading at, uh, according to you, in January, 13 times forward earnings. Max pessimism. Um, and they've been on a, a, a tear, year of efficiency, all that sort of stuff. All right, so that got re-rated to 18 times, which is still, according to you, in only the 17th percentile of their historical uh, forward PE. So it's mm-hmm. still reasonably priced. But the other five... What fundamentally changed with, I don't know, Apple's business or Microsoft? I don't or, think, I don't, I'm not sure anything really. So maybe does. we could say this. Sometimes you could just say, I don't know. And maybe there's not a good reason yeah. other than it's momentum. If you look at these stocks of Microsoft, not Google, but uh, Apple, I haven't done the work on this, but it seems like they haven't had a 3% drawdown in three quarters. Uh, the the purpose of the way that we laid out the data, as you, as you mentioned, was other than those two stocks, the other five, the entire gains this year have been multiple expansion and to levels that are at the high end of their historical range. I, they are certainly not earning. I offer true. two ideas that people, other people have floated as to why those stocks should have been re-rated higher? Number one, 
there aren't 30 pure plays on AI in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And it's very unlikely we're going to have an AI revolution that these companies don't find a way to make a lot of money from. That's valid. Is that one fair? Okay, but there, there, there are AI baskets out there. The, I mean, I know the stocks. You know. There's like five of them, and two of them are penny stocks. <laughs> and then <laughs> Nvidia, the, and then no, Nvidia. There's, there's, there's actually there's there's 32 or 33 stocks in the AI ETF. It's a chat. What's uh, the symbol? Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, the prob the problem is, uh, George. I think we looked at this. A third of them don't have a PE because they have no E. That's right. That's what I mean. <laughs> no, no, no. But all right. But so let's say What's C3, the second one? C3 AI. Sound. Uh, it's a penny stock. Bear. You have AMD. You have NVIDIA. And then you have to say to yourself, wait a minute. Obviously, Alphabet is going to be a player in AI. Yeah. Obviously, Amazon. Amazon's making its own AI chips. And they have their own AI environment. And AWS will be one of the biggest facilitators of AI in the world. So that's the answer. I think for those, Apple is not saying anything about AI. I don't know if you've noticed that. I find that really interesting. Yeah, they never say it in press and releases. He was asked. He was asked, and he said, "We don't. We don't talk. They about don't that. even talk about it." Yeah, I think we're. I think it's kind of ironic to see this AI frenzy taking place eighteen months after the last frenzy imploded of its own weight. USA. And well, no, I like. I remember equally passionate arguments about the metaverse and about hydrogen and about crypto and about other things. Now, I think, obviously, there's way more to AI than those kind of invisible ghosts which have since departed. But, you know, there, there, let's make no mistake. We're, there's an AI frenzy going on right now. It's going to be very interesting to sort out after the fact what it actually did. Uh, we have a guy who used to work at the defense department who runs all the AI projects within J.P. Morgan. Um, and it's like Morgan Freeman in uh, Batman. <laughs> He's like, that, right? Okay, go and ahead. I met with him because I wanted to learn more about the 300 AI projects. That Is it all LLMs? And what, what was really notable was just how, how unsexy they were, yeah. right? Name matching, um, form signing, errors and omissions. It, it wasn't the kindest. Now, banks have income statement line items for errors and omissions that are huge. And so th this stuff is is real. Yeah. I just think that people should start to focus on, uh, you know, the the audit business, um, document drafting, yeah. where this stuff is going to really benefit the uh, company bottom lines is the basic blocking and tackling of managing tons of information and data. Right. On the other end of this, you know, the spectrum, Let's remember, in, you know, before we get carried away with what the markets are saying and what management is saying, in 2017. Blockchain. The, bef worse than that. Oh. In 2017, the auto companies all told us, yeah. the, all the famous CEOs, that somewhere between 30 to 50% of the vehicles delivered this year would have self-driving capabilities. And, zero and I'm going to round I'm going to round it <laughs> zero. Zero, right? <laughs> so the lidar stocks have gotten absolutely destroyed. Yeah. So what's going on here? It turns out that the higher the cost of a mistake is, the worse the AI does. I don't it so it doesn't work analyzing your radiology. It doesn't work if you really need it for kind of safely driving vehicles, there's a great video on YouTube of a guy standing in the middle of the road with a stop sign and an orange cone on his head. <laughs> and he almost gets run over by the self-driving car right. because it's, it can't figure out what to do. It's not in the data training set. Oh, right? it thinks it's, it, it doesn't know if it's a it, cone it, or a person. It just, it gets confused and thrown into a confusion loop okay. because the guy's in the middle of the road, he's got a cone on his head and he's holding the stop sign. And... There's an enormous amount of work that has to get done before this higher value added stuff becomes real. So that enormous amount of work, though, is the profit center because it's – let's say we're starting with word calculators or large language models. Fine. Not that sexy. It's very sexy if you're a student who has a paper due tomorrow. But for – right? But let's say we're starting there. That large amount of work that has to get done is all of that GPU usage – and that's, I think, what's getting baked into the share prices of these companies. Maybe. May yes. Testing. Yeah, yes. Training. They're training yes. these systems. Okay. So let's, let's establish a timeline where today law firms can already use these large language models to replace some of their associates, right? They can draft legal documents, proceedings, summary judgments, and things like that. And 
they're not perfect, but then you have some associates just clean them up the last 20%. So today yeah. that can be done. Legal, auditing, basic paperwork, um, all sorts of industrial logistics uh, in terms of how goods are moved around without mistakes. At the other end of the extreme, let's take something like um, commercialized fusion, which I think is, you know, 2050, okay? I I'm, I'm increasingly suspicious that some of the advanced AI applications are, are 2040, not 2030, as it relates to things like- Dr uh, What about drug discovery? <sighs> drug discovery, it's already happening. Yeah. I, I wrote in the last eye on the market about a fascinating project where they used artificial intelligence to identify potential pathways for treating liver cancer. And within 30 days, uh, using another AI program, developed a molecular compound to, to treat it. Um, and, you know, which is now in the kind of trial phase, but it's kind of, that, that stuff is happening. What about hair replacement but, asking for a friend? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, he's the guy with the hat. <laughs> Uh, what are we doing with, uh, what are we doing with this cell signal? Oh, so getting back to, uh, I mean, just a year ago, people were screaming that we were in a recession, right? Two consecutive quarters of, of negative GDP growth. Um, we're obviously far removed from that, but I, I want to get the, your take on this tweet. I don't know if you do a lot of like intermarket analysis type stuff. Uh, if you put any credits in here, but R run Mac tweeted, um, they got a cell signal in food, beverage, and tobacco, uh, not exactly what we see historically going into a recession. John, throw the chart up, please, if you, if you would. This is a technical cell signal? Yeah. Okay. This is the Russell 1000 equal weight food, beverage, and tobacco index. Yeah. And, and they're heavy. And if you look at just consumer discretionary divided by consumer staples, this is, it's going vertical. Yeah. So how much credence do you put into the stock market and what that's telling us? Do you care about price-based signals of securities as much as we seem uh, to? Valuation-based. I, I, I'm more okay. interested in looking at what PEs are doing than what P is doing. Okay. And you why know, the PEs right now, even if you strip out the Magnificent Seven, are at the high end of the range. Okay. I can summarize our our investment views. We're we're probably in the neighborhood of normal equity risk taking allocations, but we'd be looking to reduce them into okay. the fall. Uh, so the top again, it's just the Russell 1000 equal weight food, beverage, and tobacco, yeah. and uh, it's heavy. Yeah, it and looks it looks like it wants to roll over, but that's what you would see in an economic in a early stage of a of an economic expansion. You'd see these stocks underperform. You, yeah, you certainly see them underperform some of the bigger cyclical names. But conversely, if 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 the market and again, it's not all knowing, it's not always perfect. But if the market was worried about an economic slowdown, you would see defensive names rallying, and they're not. That's they're doing right. the opposite. That's right. Okay, can we talk about your IPO piece? Uh, yes, you can. Okay. JP Morgan makes a lot of money from the underwriting calendar being healthy. I think it's going to be healthy again. In a sec I'm a shareholder in JP Morgan. So Me too. I think the, <laughs> I know you are. I think the capital markets are going to come back now. I mean, it's not a great prediction. Everyone – all right. Uh, deal count is not up year over year in Q2, but uh, the dollar amounts are going up. Mm -hmm. And stocks are – the stock market is probably a great leading indicator for – how many deals we'll see just because yeah. risk appetite writ large. Um, what what did you, you, you wrote a piece about the IPO market, SPACs in particular, you were covering from 2020 and 2021. It seemed like just a classic IPO bubble all over again, like we've had in the past. What was different about the 2020 and 2021 vintage of new companies? Going public? Okay. Yeah. So every two years, I write a piece on private equity and venture. Um, and it's only worth writing every couple of years because it takes that long to be able to kind of aggregate the performance of all the, uh, you know, the funds and look at the LP data and get the custodial data and put it all together. So I, I didn't do that this year. And I said, let's, you know what, let's look at the companies that these sponsors and, and financial entities are bringing public. Right. Particularly now that we can look in retrospect at what happened in 2020 and 2021. And okay, what was different? Well, <laughs> the big irony here was if you remember in 2014, 2015, 2017, there was a lot of hand wringing in the industry and by academics who cover the business sector about the collapse in IPO activity. Yeah, where are and all the new companies? Where are the new companies? The death birth index is collapsing. They're staying private for too long. Staying private for too long. Right. Part of which was the fact that uh, accredited invest, what qualifies as accredited investor is a definition that doesn't rise with inflation. 
So every year, more and more people were being qualified as accredited investors, right. blah, blah, blah. Let's do something desperately to bring back, you know, public listings. Let's have a pandemic. Right. Well, or, <laughs> and then, and then my tagline is, be careful what you wish for in life, you may get it. Yes. Because we got a tsunami of horrible IPO and SPAC activity. I think okay? we had a thousand IPOs in 2021. So the, the IPOs, even excluding SPACs, the IPO activity either doubled or tripled. Yeah. compared to the prior trend. Um, and here, uh, and then- This is your, and this is your chart. This, this is enormous. This is the shocker. The SPACs, which kind of came out of nowhere, all of a sudden grew to be the same size as the overall market, 2020, 2021. And, and I'm saying- right? Wait, there were as, is this in dollar terms? This is dollars. There were as many dollars raised for SPACs as there were for traditional IPOs- In like the last decade and in any year. In 2020 and 2021. That's right. Unbelievable. And now, I'm saying this with 36 years of experience in this industry. Yeah. SPACs have been the worst experiment in capital markets and corporate finance that I've ever seen. The notion that you can bring companies public, not through the IPO channel, yeah. where they have to report earnings in a certain way, they can't make earnings projections. All of a sudden, this kind of sieve opened up and you cut a hole in the sieve and all of these terrible companies went through it. It was an adverse selection exercise of terrible companies. It was, well, and the performance has been absolutely awful. So like most, like most bubbles, it started with a kernel of truth, which is, Stock market's doing great. Can't do a road show. Like physically, you can't. You cannot go on the road and take meetings with institutional investors to bring a deal but out. But they, they they had to do it anyway because they had to bring some of the institutional guys over the wall to get you know two or three hundred million dollars of committed financing at close to make those happen. You know what else happened? Because it was so retail driven, the rally in twenty early twenty twenty, um, Virgin Galactic caught fire. And that was a former SPAC. And it just so happened to have Chamath as its uh, spokesmodel. And Chamath was very popular on the internet. And then Draft Kings. And then you had a few other big consumer brand brands like Draft Kings. Open Door. Um, and that was like the genesis of do a SPAC. Oh, I'll do a SPAC. You do a SPAC. And then when the economics, the sponsor oh, economics okay. got- Let me tell you about the sponsor economics. <laughs> let me tell you- because they're, hide they're hideous. Let me tell you about the, the economics here. Uh, please, that's what you're here for, <laughs> okay. please. I couldn't believe it when I started looking at this thing because what happens is- You almost quit and became a sponsor. If you're a SPAC <laughs> sponsor, in the beginning, you were getting 20% of the shares of, of, the, the, of the merged company. Yeah. And all you had to put in was like three or five million dollars for uh, underwriting and closing. Paying fees, lawyers, right? Right. Now you had an incentive to find a merger partner, and you broke even. In most cases, even if the merged stock dropped eighty percent. Right. And because like, they that's handed a you the company for, for a disaster. It's a good deal. And it was the sponsors kind of printed money, and then once you started seeing kind of celebrities uh, and, and other and kinds of people and, get involved in promoting them. I mean, at that point, that should have been like a, you know, red alarm fire for everybody to Josh, get I think, away, I think, so. was, was, was Virgin Galactic IPOA? Was that the first one that Chamath did? Remember he was going to do the entire alphabet? I think he got to like but F maybe? I don't, no, but I don't, that was F would have been the, the right no, place no, no. to this stop. Is, this is important. And, and no disrespect to Chamath. The Virgin Galactic SPAC took place pre-pandemic. It wasn't. wasn't yeah, part if you look of at that, that chart again, there were right. a few. There were a few specs that that started to gather momentum for this stuff. But remember, the look. I'm married. I married somebody that I met at J.P. Morgan, and she worked there for twenty something years in in capital markets, Latin American capital markets underwriting. Capital markets underwriting people, whether equity or debt, their job is to generate fee revenue for shareholders. That's right. The, I don't want to say they'll underwrite anything, but it, if all of a sudden an underwriting window opens up that investors are diving into, it's the investor's fault. All the underwriters are doing are, are saying, "Look here, here's the company. The here's ducks their are story. quacking. They're feeding. Right. They're feeding now, the ducks." I would, I would, I would probably blame the Fed for this more than I would blame the underwriters. The Fed were the ones that, for the first time since the Civil War. For the first time in the United States history since the Civil War, when we weren't in a wartime, left interest rates below the rate of inflation for 10 years in a row, right? They were the ones that destroyed 
a I generation would, I would of underwriting jobs at, I would throw Not, in the jobs at. I was a fiscal stimulus as well. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, and then the, the massive amounts of stimulus. And we promoting got, security, people promoting securities on Twitter is a new phenomenon. Right. We haven't had that in prior bubbles. Right. And the so, pandemic. There's a lot of things. The, the, right. the, so the, there was the a lot. There, and a collapse in risk appetite. Yeah. So I. Can I tell you one thing about yeah. SPACs? I wrote a book in 2012, uh, Backstage Wall Street, about my experience as a retail broker. We sold SPACs all the time. It was the easiest story on earth to tell. It's $10. If they don't do a deal, you get $10 per share back plus interest. The money's sitting in escrow. If they do do a deal, you get a filler kill because you can decide whether or not you want to participate. You you have an option to say, I don't want this. And you get out before the merger is executed. Now, these were the worst. These were Chinese reverse merger SPACs. We sold the worst the worst kind you could imagine until 2021. But in my book, I called them murder holes as a category. But then I was open-minded to the idea that, wait a minute, there are legitimate people now involved in SPACs like Goldman Sachs, for example, and Bill Ackman and people that I admire. How could they, if, if these are still murder holes, how could all of these reputable investors be diving into this market? Now, I should have stuck with my original gut but I kind of was like open-minded to like, maybe SPACs have changed. You know what? They didn't change. They were pieces of shit in 2003 when I was selling them. They're pieces of shit now. I wish I had had more conviction in my own spiel. But I, I kind of, I, like most people, Look, I was the, like, maybe these are good. One of the primary features of SPACs is that at the time that you're bringing this company public and you're talking to investors, you can use management projections. You cannot do that with a regular way yeah, IPO. Yeah, yeah. In an S1, you, you can't do that. That's right. And so okay. that's it's a huge difference. I, do, I don't think that's a recoverable difference. I don't think you can build an industry. I love this chart. We're looking at annual IPO portfolio net cash flows for all sectors. And these are deeply- These are just the SPACs. Just the SPACs. Deeply off the charts negative in 2020 and 2021. The, the, the bottom so chart. So these are, to Michael's point, and the one that Josh was making, these are shit companies. Yeah, I, I, I generally use different words in the eye in the market. Uh, we have a lot of AI programs that check my language, okay. and so that wouldn't work. Okay. But um, I would I would probably use, use different language, but yeah. Um, well, isn't this simplest argument, if this was a good company, Listen, I use it natural, doesn't I use need natural language. SPAC to go public? Yeah, I think- Isn't that it? Like- I, I, there may be some small subset of circumstances where, you know, a business development corporation or a SPAC bringing the company public makes sense. But like it, 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 it doesn't need to be more than three to 5% of all underwriting public listings. And yeah. it grew to be 50%. And so that doesn't make sense. Okay. However, in your piece, yes. you did write that not all IPOs are bad and not all SPAC IPOs are bad. So for every, for investors buying every non-SPAC, I'm sorry, non-SPAC IPO since yes. 2010, median and average net returns based on a seven day holding period were substantially positive for every sector and subsector. Yes. And in the same way that the SPACs have been an empirical uh, tar pit, I really haven't seen too many things where the risk return benefits are as favorable as being an IPO flipper. Most of the paper I just wrote was written focused on longer term IPO investors who who buy and hold for two years, you know, institutional people getting in the syndicate and holding. But we also looked at the IPO flipping industry and the returns are spectacular. And what this table that you're showing shows is that the average returns, even net of the market, have been substantially positive by sector. They were from 2010 to 2019. And look what happens. The impact of those two terrible years, it didn't affect the numbers. This if is anything, average some of them went up. return by sector after seven days. So this is That's the right. initial IPO You buy pop. in the syndicate. Yeah. You buy not, not on works. first day close. You buy in the syndicate. It works. And then you sell. Yeah. And okay. and, Pete, and this is, I'm not the first one that's looked at this as a guy named Jay, Jay Ritter, Ritter at the University yeah. of Florida that does a lot of work yeah. on this. He measures one day returns. Our results are, are, are very similar. on SPACs. Yep. Is there a legitimate argument that- He's he's kind of stuck on this. Well, we, we can move on. My but, two pieces were called SPAC scene hesitancy okay. and hydraulic spacking. Okay. That, Michael, tells, I'm not that, gonna, that tells you the answer I'm going to give. I'm not going <laughs> to tell you that Josh said that he thinks Tramath is the next Buffett. I'm not going to say that here. No, I was open-minded to the possibility- at the time that it was being widely discussed, right. because How about Nicola? that's my that's my that's my you know. I was pe- going to say, in my defense, I'm an idiot. 
<laughs> Here's my question. Is there a legitimate argument to be made where certain industries would be starved of capital if there weren't a mechanism to come public while being a money-losing company with a really promising technology? No. And let's use EVs uh, as an on. example. No, no. well, well but, but don't get <laughs> me started on EVs. But – uh, on on EV I'm startups. I'm trying to be even-handed. <laughs> okay, no, but here's the reason okay. why the answer to that question is no. Because as, as we showed and as Jay Ritter and other academics have showed, the vast majority of IPOs, even in good times, are companies that have no profits at the time of the IPO. Anyway. The IPO market is open to profitless companies. Okay. Way open to profitless companies. Okay. So you don't need the SPAC market to accommodate profitless companies. They are they they go public via IPOs in droves. Do you think there'll ever be another SPAC wave again? If there is, I will do everything in my personal uh, power to stop it. And I'm gonna team up with you on that. <laughs> and I'm gonna stick to my <laughs> stick to my guns next time. Let's skip this. Uh, I want to be respectful of Michael's time and I just wanna I wanna get your take on so Wall Street strategists, pretty bearish. Uh their S P five hundred target points to the most bearish second half outlook on record. So on average, yes. they're expecting roughly a 10% drop. Right. They are digging in their heels, huh? They are. I mean, a lot of them use... Who's the chief strategist at the bank right now? Um, like I, the, like I, the, the target person. Uh, probably, I don't, I don't want to spend no, a lot, no, you know, we have Chinese walls and, you know, and okay. they do excellent research and. I think it's a hard, my point I wanted to make is I think that's a really hard job. Yeah. But you know what? My job's harder because I'm held responsible <laughs> for you. the results. All right. All right. They're cool. not right. Like that. Oh, wait, there's someone's clapping. No, <laughs> so, everyone's clapping. Everyone, everyone listening to this podcast well, no, right now wants to high five you. No, because. <laughs> Say more. It, you know, sell side people are rated based on eyeballs, but they, they are rarely really evaluated professionally based on the accuracy of their projections. In the money management industry, our compensation and our assets under management rise and fall with the quality of our performance relative to benchmarks. So what do you make of an environment where the first half of the year is a 40% NASDAQ rally, 20% S&P rally, and the, the average strategist is looking for a negative full year return. Is that what this is? Full year? No, that's, just I think it's half. just the return okay. in the second half, which would still put you up for the year. So all they're talking okay. about is that you get a retrace of the multiple fast. expansion. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't uh, think it, it's not as ridiculous as it looks on that chart, because if you pull the chart up again, it, it doesn't show you the mid 90s. Same thing happened in mid 90s. Because so, in the mid 90s, you had a couple of those years where you had the markets were rocking. And uh, and people thought there was going to be some Fed tightening or some commodity issues, and they thought that the back half of well, the year. Well, ninety nine is a great example. I think the Nasdaq doubled that year. Right. Uh, the strategists would have been right if on a second had, half pullback if they could have extended it three months. That's right. So I have okay. I have two possible guesses as to why the stock market would fall for the second half of the year. Neither of these are going to come true, obviously, if I'm guessing them. But one is earnings just do not come in where where people where they need to be given the rally. Number two is inflation reaccelerates. Any other guesses? Of what would make what would cause these, stocks don't fall for no reason. They don't. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think that the, I think the earnings and margin story is still going to be important to watch, particularly if we do not get meaningful further disinflation of wages, because of just how much wages are seventy to seventy five percent of overall input costs. For what's the companies. biggest risk to the equity markets then, in your view, for the second half of this year? Is it the usual China, China, Taiwan, whatever that everyone says, or do you have something? I mean, I, I think that'll happen in my lifetime. I just don't yeah. think it's imminent. Um, there's okay. something that people should understand about China, which is they get 80 to 90 percent of their semiconductors from Taiwan. Okay. And unless you had some kind of um, Anschluss moment where China was invited into Taiwan by a pro-China party any kind of military confrontation would result in a crippling of the supply chain for semiconductors that China needs. So that's what, oh, you're so saying I, that's what's forestalling something. I, I, heavy, this, is my personal, this is my personal belief. Sure. I, I think within the next, there, there's a kind of a semiconductor dome of protection over Taiwan for the next three to five years because China's efforts historically to build its own high quality uh, uh, semiconductor business has been mired in failure and corruption. And, you know, so they're still really reliant on Taiwan. And now even more so that the United States is trying to wall them off from Western technology. 
Okay. I want to get into the asset management uh, industry. In 36 years, you must have seen a lot of change or maybe not as much change as, as I would guess. Uh, there's a piece in the Financial Times talking about the asset management industry's potential consolidation. Um, I'll, I'll just quote this very quickly. Uh, this is PricewaterhouseCoopers is estimating 16% of existing asset and wealth managers will go out of business or be bought up by bigger groups by 2027, which is four years away. Um, and that's based on a survey of 500 asset managers and institutional investors. So that is based on how the industry itself feels about what it's seeing. I mean, it's a little solipsistic. We're all looking at our own shit and saying how we feel about it. But who else would you listen to, right? So how, uh, do you feel that that number, 16%, is overstated, understated? What's your take on the state of well, the if, asset if management Well, if that happened, yeah. it would simply be the asset management industry following, you know, investment, Everything. Uh, you know, investment banking, right? I mean, if you looked – I looked the, uh, the other day at the league tables for equity underwriting. And, you know, the it's top four underwriters control 60 to 70. four firms. That's what so, ETFs look like already. Yeah. So – but when you look – at you know wealth management, it's it's a lot more balkanized than that. Yeah, and increasingly people are going to need economies of scale, and you know um, compliance costs continue to to rise based on you know what's required. And so, yeah, I mean that sounds reasonable to me. That's following the trend of the rest of the world. Yeah. The bigger getting you know, bigger. Yeah, you know how many uh, RIA firms there are like ours? I have n I don't know. It's like eighteen thousand. Yeah, that's a Does lot. Does that sound like there's going to be eighteen thousand in five years? No, but some of them, you know, serve very local communities and-, and a new, a new one starts every two days. A new is that RIA. right? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I, when I started in the business, there were 10,000 brokerage firms. There's about 2,500 now. Yeah. So uh, this, this sounds like it makes sense directionally. Um, a lot of mutual fund consolidation probably too. Yes. Okay. All right. What does that mean for, what does that mean for uh, what you do per se? I don't know that it means a lot. Okay. I don't. I don't. I mean, we have we have a really broad client base, as I mentioned earlier, of institutional individual investors, and you know the the big question for us is, you could tell a reasonable story on an industry basis that you should hire money managers to outperform passive ETF benchmarks, and then two thousand nine hit, yeah, and then the Fed cut rates to zero, and for the next decade was pretty miserable for active managers, large cap, small cap, international, you yeah. know. It was no almost matter, across the board. Across the board. Yeah. Uh, median manager underperforming the benchmark, you know, it wasn't great. And the story was, well, the Fed kind of destroyed risk-based pricing. and Distorted you know, I, everything. Yes. I'll, I'll yeah, give you yeah. an example. In the municipal bond market, you know, New Jersey and Illinois were basically insolvent. Their general obligation bonds – uh, and irretrievably insolvent, I would add. Their general obligation bonds really trade, I don't know, 50 basis points or so wide to, you know, true AAA credits. And so what, what's happening is the when you had this zero rate policy, they collapsed risk premium everywhere. And the story was, don't worry, you just, you watch. Once those, once rates go up, we have positive real rates, we'll get a dispersion of returns and active management will rise again. Well, here we are. And, and it's know, fang, and it's fang stocks balance again. Sheet, <laughs> yeah. Balance sheet shrinking. <laughs> And now, and now you're, and, 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 and by the way, <laughs> banks, you know, the, the average money manager is never going to outperform in an environment where you've got like seven stocks. It's impossible. Right, right. What, yeah, are it's they, impossible. what are they going to be? Uh, 40% Apple? It's no, it's, no one's going to do that. Yeah. So like, so let's get through this AI craze. I think the active management industry has two to three years of normalized Fed policy. And then they're going to have a lot of difficulties with both individual and institutional investors who are like, look. I, I I can't find the last time where I was con seeing consistent industry. What if it's a marketing that. problem? What if instead of calling it active management, they call it concentrated management? Because that is something they can do. They can say, buy the S and P five hundred if you want, or these are our fifty favorite stocks. You're going to have give or take between two and four percent in each each of these names. Don't worry about the active part. We trade when we want to trade. It's concentrated equity that we're selling. Yeah, but Why at the end of the day, that? at the end of the day, you're still going to be bound by people measuring the performance the of that too. versus the, an, an ETF benchmark for large cap stocks, which what get three basis points, right? So right. there's always the question of what you could have put your money in, as you, and you can't escape the tyranny of benchmarking your performance. Okay, I wanted to do one other thing with you. Please. You wrote about 
the potential for a third party candidate for the presidency emerging, which presumably would have to happen before January when the primaries and the caucuses and all that get started. Uh, the No Labels Party is making a lot of noise. They uh-huh. put they put a se- Senator Manchin on a on a stage recently, right? Uh, who's like this kind of maverick Democrat who really votes with the Republicans, but it's I don't know. It's West Virginia, yeah. so I guess a centrist is a Democrat in West Virginia. What what should we as the investing public be thinking about the viability of this and whether or not it'll matter uh, to investors? So. I write about politics when they have the potential to influence asset prices. That's right. So I wrote a lot about what happened a couple of years ago because, you know, depending on how, how things turned out, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Electoral Count Act and everything else, you know, if, if rule of law gets violated in the United States, that's bad for risk premium. Yeah. So I started paying attention to this little no labels movement because they're saying something that's a little bit more aggressive than than what you were just saying, which is they're saying after Super Tuesday, okay, if both parties nominate who they consider to be uh, unpopular candidates based on whatever their different that happens to be, they may run a unity ticket that they have pre-registered in all 50 states. And so I think the chances of a unity ticket succeeding um, are low for the first third, time at least or are, yeah. are, you okay. i mean third party union tickets are very unlikely to win yeah the analysis that we didn't last in the july on the june eye in the market was a little different because what i wanted to look at is what happens first of all what happens like a ralph nader situation yeah biden loses if, votes if on happens. the margin you pull from, or this is the really interesting one you know it's two it's you know first past the post 270 yeah We came very close historically a couple of times, whether it was George Wallace, John Anderson, Ross Perot, to third-party candidates winning enough electoral votes to to prevent both of the other candidates from reaching 270. Chaos. What most people don't understand is what then what happens is what's called the 12th Amendment contingent election. Okay? How does that work? Every state, congressional delegation, gets one vote. Mm. So the guy in Alaska— or woman in Alaska, the one congressperson in Alaska gets to vote for Alaska. California also gets one vote, and it's however that state delegation happens to pan out. Republicans control the majority of state delegations. Yeah, they would love that, right? So if the no labels movement runs a ticket that wins enough electoral votes to prevent, let's say, both Trump and Biden from hitting 270, under my read— of the way this all would work, you would have a 12th Amendment contingent election and the GOP delegations, there's 20, at least 26 of them, uh, would control the outcome and and you would get a GOP president. So it's almost worse so than, I, the, than the Electoral College. The 12th well, Amendment condi- contingent is- I, I, If less- people don't like the democratic principles under you know underneath the, yeah. the, uh, the regular Electoral College, they will definitely they will not, not like, like the this. 12th Amendment contingent election. And the reason I wrote about this is that there's some former J.P. Morgan people that are very actively involved in the no labels movement. I respect the reasons for them trying to come up with a unity ticket, but I wrote about this because I wanted everybody to understand the risks of a failed unity ticket. Yes. So you run the ticket, it succeeds enough to win 30 electoral votes, and those 30 electoral votes happen to be enough to prevent both other candidates from passing 270, and then I just want everybody to understand what happens. My best guess is that a third-party ticket, whether it's a unity or not, is a net deficit for Biden and not for Trump. Well, that's that's another risk to think about, and one of the other, uh, some of the charts that were in the June in the market that you might have noticed looked at all the historical situations yeah. where third-party candidates, even just a small 3 4 5% of their votes moving to another candidate would have changed the outcome in that state. Right. It's, it's, it's a spoiler for somebody either way. That's right. Um, I have an idea for presidential candidate. Can I play oh. something for you? Yeah. <laughs> The other way around. America has the best hand ever dealt of any country on this planet today. Ever. I recognize that voice. <laughs> okay, and um, Americans don't fully appreciate what I'm about to say. We have peaceful, wonderful neighbors in Canada and Mexico. We've got the biggest That's military the ba- barriers ever built called the Atlantic and the Pacific. 
We have all the food, water, and energy we will ever need. Okay? We have the best military on the planet, and we will for as long as we have the best economy. And if you're a liberal, listen closely to me in that one, because okay? the Chinese would love to have our economy. We have the best universities on the planet. They're great ones elsewhere, but these are the best. We still educate uh, you know, most, of the, most of the kids who start businesses around the world. We have a rule of law which is exceptional. If you don't believe me, and we talk about Britain, Brazil, Russia, India, Venezuela, Argentina, uh, China, India. Believe me, it's not quite there. We have a, a magnificent work ethic. We have innovation from the core of our bones. You can ask anyone in this room, what can you do to be more productive? Ask your assistants, factory floors. We, we have do SPACs. It. It's not just a Steve Jobs. Yeah, this is SPACs. broad death. We have the widest and deepest financial markets the world's ever seen. Okay? And if you, I just made a list of these things, and maybe I missed something. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary, and we have it today. Yes, we have problems, but you know, I, when I hear people down, if you travel around the world, I mean, get an airplane, travel around the world, and go to all these other countries, and tell me what you think. All right, and that, of course, uh, is Jamie Dimon and uh, your, your boss. So I'm a Dimon fangirl, and when that, so that, that July 4th and that week, that like went viral, that clip, and when I heard it, I said, well, a lot of people probably think that was impromptu. I've heard him do that before. This is one of the better versions. But that is a hell of a stump speech. And I know he's not officially running. My theory is, why would he leave J.P. Morgan before the headquarters is built? Like, like at least enjoy a year at the... All right. So here's what I want to ask you. Go ahead. And I already know your answer, but give it to me anyway. I know you don't want to lose him as the CEO of J.P. Morgan if you're going to stay there. But if you did lose him and you lost him to the White House, that would kind of be okay for you, right? Like if that's what ended up if if that's what ended up happening, yeah. you'd, you'd be well, okay. A couple with that. things, okay. You know, I've, Jamie is so far above and beyond any chairman that I've worked for, and that includes some pretty amazing people. Like, but you've only worked like, in in one firm, but you've worked under no, sub, yes. several. Yes, I mean, okay. I'm not talking about Dennis Weatherstone and Lou Preston and yeah, people yeah, yeah. that were the giants of their day, right? You know. Jamie is kind of remarkable in his ability to kind of see the big picture, the little picture, risk management, making people sure do people do their jobs, making sure that we have, you know, defensible margins across a wide variety of businesses. I mean, it's, he, he's, he does an amazing job. Yeah. And one of the best parts of my job is my favorite is when he calls me and says, I need your help on something. That's the favorite part of my job. Okay. Yeah. So he's incredible. I don't think calling out liberals is a successful way to win the Democratic primary. I don't think it's I, – I, so I think that avenue is cut off. Yeah. So unless everybody, everybody, he is, everybody will forget. I, I, I don't um, think it matters. Let me, I, tell, you, let me tell you a story. <laughs> please. About, uh, about who, who votes in primaries. Okay. So in 2016 um, – and, and by the way, I, I've never done media before. Like this is my first – media well, you did experience. The best, you did in, literally in, the best show there is. In 36, so. I've never, I don't, I don't talk to Barrett. I don't talk to the journal. I don't like, so for whatever reason, yeah. even though I hadn't met you, I was like, you know what? I'll do this one. Yeah. You know? Uh, and somewhere, someplace, there are some uh, compliance yeah, yeah. and people at JP Morgan that are right now having an aneurysm. No, no, no. I think we, but, I think, <laughs> I think we did a good job at, at you don't give any advice. Let me you know? All right, go ahead. So go ahead. in the 2016 primary, um, on the day of the Republican convention, uh, on the third day, they had like a let's uh, a business. It was like let's talk about the business and the economy. And the speaker was the guy from Duck Dynasty, right? <laughs> so that told you something about the seriousness of of that. Okay. But then, to me, what was more disappointing was um, in Democratic convention historically, the governor of the state hosting it speaks on the last day. Okay. So Tom Wolf, who was the governor of Pennsylvania, yeah, gets sure. up. And he says, you know, I, I, I started, you know, I served in the Peace Corps. I came back. I went to work for my family's cabinet business. And we were one of the biggest job creators in the state of Pennsylvania. And you could tell that his speechwriter said, pause for applause. <laughs> there was none. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely none. And to me, this is personal, okay? Um, you know, my father was a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat. We had – we adopted a stray cat that was a son of a bitch, and, and my father named it Spiro after Spiro Act. Okay. Right? So it. he was a, a, a hardcore Democrat. He would have been really sad 
to see yeah. what happened in the Democratic convention. Not a single clap of applause for a guy that created private sector jobs. Right. Now, you know, okay, it's an anecdote, but I just think it tells you something about the politics of what somebody like Jamie would be dealing with in a Democratic primary. What if he's on the right side of the social issues? All right, so fine. He's ca it's capitalism, it's big banks, blah, 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 fine. But what if he's on the right side of all the social issues, starting with Roe v. Wade and ending with uh, Im immigration reform? And like, what if he does that part right? I, I, it's, I, 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 it's hard for me to comment for a lot of reasons here, but street. I think that there's four or five Democratic senators that would start out with a little radar yeah, gun on day one and then... You know, and, and it's, a, I, it's a shame that a country as amazing as ours with people like this in it, uh, like is it, it's just it's too hard for somebody to get through. Because I would of love these. to be proven wrong. Yeah, I'll me just too. let me just leave it at that. Me too. All right. Shout, shout to Jay. you answered that really well. I had to I had to hit you with it because uh, it's something that I think would be would be great. I don't know if it'll ever happen. Do you have fun on the show today? I know you don't do a lot of these, so we really I've appreciate it so much. I've never done any of them. So I had a great time. Okay, even even starting with the improv act <laughs> and all the way through here. Yeah, this is this is a unique thing. All right, Michael. But I'm willing to do this one time. All right, there Michael, we'll Michael, take it. Michael you, were, you were incredible on the show. We leave our audience with one last thing. Right. We leave them with a book or a blog post or a video or anything that you're watching or enjoying that you think more people should know about. Do you wanna you wanna hit us with something? Well, you know, the, the people enjoy different things. So I enjoy, like for instance, on my honeymoon, I had a book on the history of um, uh, of the Protestant Reformation and things like that. So w w what's enjoyable to me may not be. <laughs> so enjoyable. You're, set, you're setting the baseline. I'm setting the baseline. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, so last month, a judge, I don't know, it was a circuit court judge, f okayed the Sackler family. Yeah. Deal. Six billion in exchange for uh, uh, immunity from individual lawsuits against everything com members. Everything combined. So it's six billion dollars for whatever, um, which is reportedly, you know, around half of what they own. Okay. Of what they own. And there's a book by Raymond Keeve called Empire of Pain about the Sackler family. And, you know, it came out 18 months or so ago. Uh, it's a great it's a great thing to read to mm. kind of understand how this all happened. Um, because I, I did a lot of research on the other side of this, which is the, the opioid epidemic kicked in and directly coincides in counties that had the greatest degree of competition with China after China joined the World Trade Organization. You think there's a so for many there. years, well, do very directly, and there's a guy named David Autor, A, a U T O R M I T, who's who's done a lot of work on this kind of thing. And when you look at the counties that had the the highest degree of direct competition with China, that's where the job losses, the manufacturing losses, the decline in in real wages, and the opioid addictions rose the most. Wow. So I historically always had my eye on China joining the WTO as the fuse that lit the opioid epidemic. Which is what, 1999, 2000? To 2006. Yeah. When you read this book, you realize that that fuse would have been impossible to light without the m really kind of horrifyingly malevolent activities of the people behind the OxyContin epidemic. Yeah. And it reminds me, you also said something to me about my favorite movie. And... My favorite movie of all time is The Third Man with Orson Welles. Okay. And there's this scene where he's up with Joseph Cotton and he looks down and he says, come on, Holly, you mean you would, you would not make money if all you had to do is just get rid of some of those little dots on the ground? Meaning right? the people? The people. Yeah. And, and, and it, made, it reminded me of some of the things in that book, Empire of Pain. Um, and so I just, like, I, for me, that's a really kind of interesting way to understand the origins and um, momentum behind the opioid. Well, there's epidemic. such a huge political fallout as a result of that as well. Like it's pr probably permanently changed politics in America. Just how many places were just willing to vote for volatility of any kind. Yeah, and I think the way that I think about it is China joins the WTO and is a massive windfall for consumers. Yeah. And it's a massive windfall for investors, yeah. right? Because margins kind of 
massively expand for all the reasons you can imagine. And US manufacturing communities take it on the chin hard. Yeah. Since 2018, that's been moving in reverse. Yeah. Right? So we are getting an unwinding of all this globalization. And, you know, I have some misgivings about some components of Biden's industrial policy, but I think it's going to revive some of those manufacturing communities that got Re hurt so reshor hard. Reshoring and building semiconductors here is better than just a blanket trade war. Absolutely. I think so. Better for people. Yeah. All right, love it. My love it. my favorite thing this week was this. I have been looking forward to this for so long. Aww. We, You're one of the few people that every time it hits my inbox, I get excited to read it. Uh, so thank you for yeah. thank you very much. all the work that you do and be Much so generous great. with your time today. This is you're amazing. Welcome. Good right, to meet you guys. Here's my favorite. I'm playing, I'm pl I'm playing something else. Uh, Isn't it weird how we made almost everything up and it still sucks? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like, you know they turn the stock market off every night and they turn it back on every morning. <laughs> and they're like, we're in a bubble, it's gonna burst. It's bound to happen any day now. It's like, then leave it off. <laughs> what is it? What the f are you doing turning it back off? Today might be the day. An idiot. They're like, the dollar's down, the economy's f***ed. It's like, why don't we just say it's not? <laughs> How's that sound? That yeah, person's Canadian, right? Sounds good. Yeah. Right? They're like, these people have all the money. These people have no money. It's like, print more. Give it to them. <laughs> they go, we can't. It will devalue the currency. Just say it doesn't. <laughs> Who is this? Hold on. Hold on. Do I know Everything it? Everything is made up. Let's make it more fun. Let's base interest rates on how interesting you are as an individual. So that is a comedian named Pat Bersher. Do you know him? No. You ever see him? No. All right. I thought that was pretty funny. Michael, I want to echo what Michael Batnick said. We are huge fans of yours. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, how do people get a hold of Eye on the Market if they're not currently receiving it. Do they have to have a relationship with J.P. Morgan? Is that the best way for them to do it? Yeah, th okay. that, that will that will get it to you automatically. That'll get I it do, to you. I do post lots of them on my LinkedIn account. You sure? Do. Oh, people could follow you on LinkedIn. That's yes. right. Okay. I also have an Instagram account, but Ooh. that's just my personal fishing. Well, adventures. let's not tell I'm anyone. Big, let's not tell anyone to go there. You know, I I'm a big kayak fisherman. I know oh. we had to pull you out of the kayak to to do this, and so right. we really appreciate it. Uh, you're 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 amazing. We we've learned so much today. I think our audience has learned so much today. So thank you so much for joining well, us. Thank you. Much appreciated. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to episode 101 of the Compound and Friends. Make sure to do all the liking and subscribing, and we will see you later. Take us out. <laughs>